So this video is going to cover acetylcholine. So this is one of the neurotransmitters that we talk about in a lot more detail. We don't just say what the receptor is and what the neurotransmitter's effect on the receptor is. We kind of talk more about the life cycle of it, um, how it's uptake in, all that good stuff. So we want to talk in detail about this neurotransmitter. And the reason acetylcholine in particular is so important is because this is one of the most widely studied neurotransmitters, mostly because of how easy it is to study the neuromuscular junction which is the junction between this alpha motor neuron, also called a lower motor neuron, and the muscle fiber at this region known as the plate, right? So if you were to take away this axon terminal here, you would see this shape that looks kind of like a plate. And that plate structure is the namesake for the end plate potential, which is the EPP. And that's just a fancy way of saying EPSP. Out of, for some reason, they like to differentiate, but it's really not different as far as we're concerned. But the reason I mention this is because acetylcholine, we can draw in red, and I kind of always like to draw acetylcholine in red for some reason. But acetylcholine is released at this neuromuscular junction, and what it does is it actually binds to nicotinic acetylcholine receptors on the postsynaptic cell, which in this case just happens to be the muscle fiber, right? So this channel right here is called the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, or sometimes they just call it NACH. They just leave off the R. So this is, what, this is a really important neurotransmitter, and this, this neuromuscular junction specifically has been widely studied for a really long time, um, especially in the frog. So this kind of has given us a lot of what we know about neuroscience and, and vesicle recycling and all that kind of stuff. And that's a question for another lecture. But what I want to go over real quick in this video is just everything that happens to acetylcholine, how it's produced, how it's reuptake in, what does it bind to, and all that kind of stuff. So you can get a sense of this neurotransmitter holistically. I know we like to talk about it as we talk about other neurotransmitters, so I want to kind of break it down into one video about one neurotransmitter. And I'll do this for glutamate and GABA as well. So what I'll start with is the fact that neurotransmitters, and this is kind of just a general rule, neurotransmitters are almost always, so I'll say, just produced, and then I'll put a star here, almost always produced in the neuron itself. So one of the reasons you can't just take dopamine, right? you have to take a precursor of dopamine as a drug if you need dopamine in your system, is because neurotransmitters don't cross the blood-brain barrier, which is a barrier between your blood capillary walls and your brain tissue. And the reason for that is we don't need neurotransmitters to go through that barrier because we have neurotransmitters being produced by the neurons themselves. So if I'm going to detail the life cycle of acetylcholine, what I want to start with is cellular respiration. And I won't go into detail with this, but everyone knows that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. But basically, the reason that's important for acetylcholine is that it produces pyruvate from glucose. And that gets converted, and this is two molecules of pyruvate, you don't need to know that, but it converts that to acetyl-CoA, and then finally to acetate. And this is specific for the formation of acetylcholine. So if I'm going to draw just, just what you need to know, I'll just say mitochondria produces acetate. In addition, you have choline, and I'll talk about where that comes from a little later because it's a little more complicated. But if you combine acetate and choline using an enzyme called choline acetyltransferase, transferase, also known as CHAT, you get acetylcholine. Then we have our vesicle, we have our proton pump that acidifies the vesicle or creates that proton gradient. And then we have vesicle-associated pore protein that gets acetylcholine into the vesicle. 
I think this is like VACH or something like that, which just stands for vesicle acetylcholine. So the vesicle binds, yada, yada, yada. And what we eventually get is this acetylcholine release. So I'm going to draw all these red dots out here. And remember, these red dots are what I'm using to show acetylcholine. So that's just what happens with the presynaptic side. So we want to talk also about what happens both at the postsynaptic side and as a function of astrocytic end feed, which kind of sit in the space of this synapse. So, you know what? That was a mistake. I'm going to not talk about astrocytes in this because they're not as important. So we're just going to focus on the presynaptic and the postsynaptic cell. And remember, we have three general fates of a neurotransmitter. So I'll call these three fates. We got one, binding to a receptor. Two, um, enzymatic degradation. And three, reuptake, right? So a molecule of acetylcholine can bind to a receptor. In the neuromuscular junction, this is most commonly going to be the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Although, as we've talked about, there's also a couple other types of uh, acetylcholine receptors, which I'll get into a little in a sec. But what can happen is two molecules of acetylcholine, and that's really important. Remember, it's always two molecules of neurotransmitter binds to a receptor, uh, uh, anotropic receptor. And that can allow for the influx of sodium. If the equilibrium potential is a little higher, sometimes it results in the efflux of potassium, which I won't really talk about. Um, and this is what kind of solidifies acetylcholine as an excitatory neurotransmitter. Because usually what it's doing is it's opening ligand-gated ionotropic channels like this N ACH in regions of the membrane where the membrane potential is at around negative 65, right? So that's kind of more around resting membrane potential. And as we remember from earlier sections of this course, equilibrium potential for potassium is a, around the same value. So potassium is not going to really want to move. So at this membrane potential, at resting, what's going to happen is sodium is going to flow in because it has a really high equilibrium potential, and that's going to cause this excitatory input. So you're going to get these positives in here. But that's not the whole story because you, you need to clear neurotransmitter from the cleft. Initially, if you don't, you're going to have overexcitation. But what's going to end up happening is because if one neurotransmitter is bound to this ligand-gated ionotropic receptor, it will be desensitized. So it'll allow for current in, but then it'll rapidly close, and you need both of those neurotransmitters to bud off of that ligand-gated ion sharp acceptor so that you can reopen it. Well, if you have too much acetylcholine in the synapse, what's going to happen is when one comes off, another one's just going to come right back on. And when the other one comes off, another one's just going to come right back on. So if you have a high enough concentration, these receptors will all open at first, but then they'll totally desensitize. Um, so this is one of the things you have to be careful with when you just, just um, design drugs for this purpose, you want to make sure you're not completely blocking reuptake or completely blocking proteasomal degradation or um, enzymatic degradation, because you don't want to you don't want to cause these synapses to be overloaded and then desensitized. So one of the ways that the synapse clears out acetylcholine, and this is really specific to acetylcholine, has to do with proteins that are anchored to the cytoskeletal cage. So this is a filamentous extracellular matrix system that's established by both of these, both the pre- and the postsynaptic cell. And on this cage, or adhered to this filamentous extracellular matrix, is an enzyme known as acetylcholine esterase. So this is a C... Handwriting sucks. Acetyl 
acetylcholinesterase. Acetylcholinesterase. And what this does is it breaks ACH or acetylcholine into acetate and choline. And there was a reason I'm circling this. So choline, if this is a transporter, and you don't need to know the name of it, but choline will actually go back into the cell. So it'll be reuptaken directly into the neuron. So I'm going to call this neuronal reuptake. The reason for this is because acetate is produced by the mitochondria, so it doesn't need to reuptake acetate. What and remember, all of this is actually happening here. I just didn't have space for it. So there's also acetate here. Acetate isn't reuptaken because it doesn't need to do that. It needs choline to come back because it can't produce choline. So this choline actually comes from there. But the acetate, remember, comes from the mitochondria. So there's a reason they only reuptake choline. Um, what else are we going to talk to you about? So the, the receptors, right? We talk about the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor because it's the most widely studied. It's the one that really matters to us in terms of neuromuscular, um, the, the neuromuscular junction and that classical synapse that we've studied a lot. But that's obviously not the only type of receptor. So we also have a muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. And sometimes these are just called M's. And this is one of the questions on your quiz that got a lot of people confused. So like M1 or something like that, I think they should write it out as MACH1, but you know some people like to just memorize things. So M stands for muscarinic, right? And that might be kind of confusing because muscarinic kind of sounds like the word muscle, um, but M just stands for muscarinic. Honestly, I'm not really sure what muscarinic means, but just know that that's a metabotropic receptor meaning it doesn't it doesn't function in the way a ligand gated inotropic receptor does it binds the ligand or acetylcholine in this case and it leads to an extracellular uh, intracellular sorry intracellular cascade of events that causes some kind of permeability shift from to one ion or another um, whereas the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor or I'll just call it the NACH, is going to be your classic ligand-gated. And just a fun fact for you, that's the reason it's called nicotinic is obviously because it, it binds, it re responds to nicotine. But Dr. Walren's favorite story is they took this muscle and they took a, a camel's hairbrush, which is a really weird not exactly sure why he feels the need to specify that it was for a camel, but they shaved it down to one, like one fiber, one hair of this hairbrush, and they just covered it in nicotine. And then they took this frog muscle and they tapped it down on different regions, and they discovered that if they tapped it down in, let's say it was this region, you would get a muscle contraction. So if you tapped this camel's hairbrush with nicotine on it to this one specific region that they then discovered was the end plate that would lead to a muscle contraction so that's why they call it the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor um in terms of the structure of this there's five subunits and they're alpha beta Gamma, delta, epsilon. Can't remember how to do gamma or delta. But anyways, just don't remember that. I don't know why I even said that. Just remember there's five subunits and they're named after Greek letters. And I would remember that the alpha subunit is the one that binds neurotransmitter. All right. And that should be good for that. Definitely look out for my next video on the life cycle of glutamate. Thanks.